Sue, Frankie, you're up next to talk <coughs> about health and the nursing curriculum. It's not going to be nearly as creative. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I love TED Talks, and I was watching something on TED Talks about how to give a presentation. Mm -hmm. So I tried in my kitchen, <laughs> and I am so monotonous, it's scary. It's all right. No, even the dog got bored. So, um, but a very effective of director of nursing, I have to say. <laughs> what? <laughs> but a very effective director of nursing. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, so do you have the report uh, that I yes. sent along with? Yeah. Uh, because I think that sort it's of captures more information than what's on the PowerPoint slides. Um, so it's just to the right, it'll right click. Okay, great. So anyway, it's actually been a fabulous year. I'm not gonna um, lie. Um, on, this is the agenda of what I'm looking to present, and you all have copies of the PowerPoint, so I won't spend too much time on this. Um, I'm just gonna go through the general statistics. So when I report every month to the Department of Public Health, I have to break down statistics, and it's a, it's a eight or nine page report that I send in every month, and then I have to do a large report at the end of the year with a, um, accumulation and other questions that I have to fill out. So total, um, as of last week when I did this report, we had almost 52,000 student encounters. Um, when, I, when you look at the line that says management, um, that refers to when a school nurse has to do field trip management and put together all the necessary mm -hmm. documentation and EpiPens and inhalers uh, for the teachers um, and make sure that we have nursing coverage for those field trips. And we'll talk about field trips a little bit later. Uh, it also includes any kind of um, meeting that they go to. So if there's an IEP meeting or a 504 meeting with a parent, that gets included into management. What is not captured here is the actual time spent. Um, our numbers are really good and tight this year compared to previous years. We have, um, um, there was sort of a learning curve on how to capture data and put, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If we put information into our electronic medical records, that's not necessarily the best way to put it in. I can't capture that data really well. So we worked really hard this year on trying to do that, and I, I think it was fairly effective. Um, the other category, which is the largest category, you know, this is how electronic medical records break things down. Um, if I could do it my own way, I would do it differently. So minor illnesses will get included in that. You know, someone that has pink eye might get included in that, even though it should technically be an illness. But um, I don't create the software and I can't change it. So, although I'm trying to, but they only listen to me once in a while. Um, and then what I did is I took those numbers and projected them out for the um, end of the school year. And it says projected until 613. I meant to put 623, so that's my mistake. Okay, so I'll move on. Any questions on that? Great. Um, these are administrations for medications thus far. Um, I didn't want to put in thus far for 2017, but in, as you can see, our projected number for general medications um, at the end of the year will be over 13,000 meds given out, and that includes, by the way, insulin. I have insulin in another line, but that 13,000 is inclusive. Um, we've doubled our epinephrine administration this year, but you know, these are low numbers, so a 100% increase doesn't really mean that much. Um, in the report, you'll see that I put five in parentheses, because I think someone forgot to, ca I'm pretty sure we gave five EpiPens this year. Uh, it's in the back of my head. Um, so I just uh, wanted to mention that. What is not included in these med administrations are just giving ibuprofen for headaches, Tylenol, cramps, whatever people come in for. That type of medication is not included in, in, in that. Um, okay. And in, another thing that's not mentioned here is 911 calls. We've had, they've been half this year than they were last year. And when and I dug a little deeper, the only thing I could find is mental health related 911 calls have gone down quite a bit. So let's hope that continues to be the case. And that's mostly at the high school level. So we'll just talk briefly about epinephrine. Oh, there is, there's the five in parentheses. So I, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because this is a bill. I don't know um, um, if this has come across anybody's desk, but the Massachusetts Medical Society, the MMS, has proposed a bill to have parents not bring EpiPens to school, that the schools will provide them. We do have stock EpiPens. We always have. Um, and except we could probably put forth a 
forth a policy in which we require it for field trips, but uh, it's a little concerning. Now, this is at the state level, so it's, it's up for vote. Um, and so if anybody wants to weigh in on it, I highly suggest they do that now. Uh, the Department of Public Health is against this bill. I don't know how the Department of Education stands on it. EpiPens are ridiculously expensive. Mm -hmm. I, for those that know, they've gone up exponentially. We won't get into the ethics of that right now, mm -hmm. but my land just got a kick in the butt with the massive recall recently, so that was interesting. My land does give us stock EpiPens for free. I apply every year for a grant and we get free EpiPens for the schools, which saves us thousands of dollars because I tried to price out my land EpiPens and the cheapest I could get them was at Costco for 600 and something dollars for a twin pack. So we can go to now this generic. Well, the cheapest I could get on the generic was $269 and that was pulling strings uh, for a twin pack. Um, so they are very expensive even for the generics. So this year uh, we had to buy some because of the recall with my land. There was a delay and um, we needed them as soon as possible because ours were expiring, so we had to buy them. And that hurt a lot. Um, it killed me because shortly after we got ours from uh, more medical supply, my land sent the box. Oh. That hurt. That was a bad day. But <laughs> that's okay. We move forward. Um, so we have given mostly stock EpiPens. Most of the EpiPens that we administered in the district this year were actually stock. Uh, some new cases of, of um, kids needing them. Um, we have a lot more orders on file than 234, but I estimate 234 kids in the district as opposed to 199, which I think was two years ago. Maybe three. I think it was two. Um, okay. Can, ask, can we ask a question now sure. about this? Go ahead. Is it okay? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So if, uh, if we had to um, have only uh, stock EpiPens, how many would you think we would have to have a good in order? Question. I mean, we've only used five. I realize, I mean, I too had children that mm -hmm. went to school with them and, you know, I don't know how many we went through, but, um, you know, how many would you feel like you had to have in stock? Depends on how many kids in the school more. have active. Right. Um, so, it, and it also depends on field trips. So, I mean, there's a lot of other, right, yeah. you know, do we want to keep one in the, um, in the nurse's office and, and um, by, by a gym and by um, uh, the cafeteria where a lot of right. things happen. Um, I would be comfortable, now remember they come in two different doses, so um, it's a two pack of two different doses, so we would have, we have four minimally in each school, two of each dose. Um, I would be comfortable with, I'm, I'm okay with that for now, but then we have to restock what we, right. what we use and it yeah, doesn't always yeah, come in overnight. Yeah, right. So um, in the larger schools, I would have to say four for each size dose. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I had a question about that too. The different size EpiPens, how do you know which, if, if you're having, using your stock ones, how do you know for each child which one you're going to use? General weight. Okay, I know, you, so you just eyeball it. We eyeball a child, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if they're a tiny little thing, we give the, the junior. You, mm -hmm. Even if a child is on the cusp and you give a larger dose, you're not doing harm to that child. Right. So, um, it's a, yeah, I'm not going to sit there and weigh them. <laughs> yeah, that, that's... <laughs> um, but, yeah, we just eye, we would, we eyeball it. Okay. And, and, yeah. What's the shelf life? Huh. Uh, it's... It's about a little over a year if you're lucky. So you'd be looking to restock every year. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if I may just follow up, go ahead. When I taught a million years ago, the, it was the responsibility of the parent to notify, provide, <coughs> and uh, if the, provide an extra one or an updated one. On, I mean, we communicate. So the, this in, the intent of the state is for the school to do all of that, or would the, the family still be allowed? Oh, the family would be allowed to. But it would... It's to offset the expense. It's to offset the expense. Yeah, this was um, proposed by a physician. Now, I'm a medical provider. I just gave an EpiPen two weeks ago and then wrote the prescription for it for him as he was getting let out in the ambulance. And um, we had a couple of extra in the clinic that I work at. We had a couple of extras and that were going to expire in August, and we had our new stock, so I said, here, take these. You know... Uh, I hope I'm not being recorded right now. <laughs> <laughs> Delegation of medication. Um, but yeah, it's it's just so expensive, you know. Um, but yeah, that would so parents could still bring them in, absolutely. 
And you know, my feeling is maybe kids should just have them in their backpacks as well. If I right. Yeah. Right. Last one, I promise. That's okay. Uh, if if a family can't afford it right now, is that we don't deny them field trips and things of that nature? Do oh we? no, of course not. Okay, thank you. Of course not. No, we never do that. Thank you. And we do teach. The teachers get trained every year, and the um, cafeteria staff and um, and whomever else needs to be trained is trained every year. We have to do that by state mandate. So, yeah. Dr. Seuss. Oh, it, um, I was just wondering, so what do you think about this new piece of legislation? I mean, you seem to you sort of see both sides, or, uh, or do, do, you, do you not want to sides. say? So, yeah, that's why I was asked about being recorded, because, yeah. you know, <laughs> you being recorded. DPH says, no, 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 we don't like this. And, you know, as a provider, I get it. I really do. Um, they are expensive. And so I can, I mean, parents are going to need them anyway. And so, and we... We do get, we have given more than what the state said. Well, you know, most places are only giving one or two a year. Well, we've given five, you know, or four. Talking about it is four, but we, I think we've given five. Um, so, yeah, I do see both sides. My, I actually wrote to the Mass Medical Society a couple of weeks ago and said, well, why don't we do what they do at the MIT clinic, which is you keep ampules of epinephrine, and we just draw it up in a syringe. The nurse draws it up in a syringe, not a teacher, <laughs> and give it. I mean, that's what they do in hospitals. That's what they do in clinics. Why don't we do it? You know what the cost is? $10. Interesting. Okay, at best. <laughs> Interesting. And that's with a specialized syringe so that you can't screw up, or it's pretty hard to anyway. But that's our scope of practice. The, the nurses in the in the schools, their scope of practice is that they can do that. And if we're doing that in hospitals, why can't we do it anywhere else? I don't expect a teacher to do that. I still think we need stock, uh, a, or stock EpiPens for teachers. But, my, but if you look at the way, and I have it actually on here, this is from the Mass Medical Society. This is exactly how they, they wrote their proposal. Um, it specifically says an auto injector. Well, why does it have to be an auto injector? Mm -hmm not doing auto-injectors in the hospitals mm -hmm. right. or in the clinics at MIT. I only know that because I have a grad student working for me that was working there. So why can't we do that? I just mm -hmm. We'll see. I don't know what they'll propose. Uh, so I, I just want to say, I, as a parent whose kid has an EpiPen, but for an extremely rare thing that she would never encounter in school, <laughs> it's sort of a, a frustration that they keep expiring because we know that this thing that she's allergic to, she's not going to encounter in school, and yet we still have to replenish it. Right. So that's another so, reason I'm on yeah. the fence. I, yeah. I get both sides of the debate. I really do. And I'm not going to take a position on it. Um, you know, uh, or the parents just bring in one. I mean, I, I've had some pushback from some nurses in the past. Where they, no, no, we need two. And I, no, we don't really need yeah. two because we can use our stock if we have yeah. to. So I, you know, I, 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 I do see both sides. Mr. Gardner. Yes. So um, I, I do want to send you the Shrewsbury policy on I this. I saw that. Okay. Because that, and so I'm, I'm on the policy, I'm chair of the policy committee this year, and so that might be something we want to look at. It's sort of a happy medium. It says if there is a supply, then you don't have to require parents to right. bring it in. You know, I'm also, I can't believe there's only 234 because everybody I know seems to have a kid with an allergy. <laughs> I do as well. And, and what gets you is we do have one in her backpack because she goes to other people's houses after school, right. but she also has to have one in, at, given to the school. So it seems like there should be some flexibility in there well, that, can, that can help us. So we'll, hopefully we'll look at that during the year. I, I agree with that. And I think that the physician that proposed this bill is from Shrewsbury, and that's why, oh. yeah, I'm pretty sure that's where he's from. Great. Um, Thanks. Just a little FYI. <laughs> Any other questions on this? Okay, so um, defibrillators, I don't know if anyone received phone calls over the summer from, there was a senator's office that they were calling us. Um, they were calling everybody. Do you have defibrillators in the building? And I'm like, why are they calling us? Of course we have defibrillators in the buildings. But it's because this was getting ramped up and it was passed um, at the state level that we had to have defibrillators on the building. So we were well ahead of the um, curve on that, so it was, it was a non-issue. Um, and that did go through in, in January of this year that they had to have them. Defibrillators for sporting events is another issue altogether. I'm not going to I'm not going to go there on this talk. Um, Narcan is also um, being told by the state that we have to have Narcan in the schools, which we do. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that that's not an issue. Also, all of our emergency bags have it, and thank goodness we've never needed it. So um, I did want to talk about Espert briefly. We talked about that last year at the school committee. 
-hmm. Could you um, just SBIRD stands for? Okay, uh, it's screening, brief intervention, and referral for treatment. Okay. So this is a mandated screening by the state. Um, this was the pilot year. So last year we got a grant to pilot it. There was um, not that many uh, districts in the state that got the grant because people didn't think about applying for it, but they gave us $10,000 and we, we piloted it and uh, with the seventh grade this year. And it went incredibly well. We had Ivy LaPlante run it. She was who sat with me last year when we talked about it. and. She did a phenomenal job. She really did. Um, next year, we are required to run it at both the middle school and the high school level. We picked the two grades that the state recommended, seventh grade and ninth grade. This is a screening tool. We use the craft tool, the craft two, actually. It's slightly modified. I did put a um, URL up there for anybody that wants to look at it. We use the same screening tool in medical offices quite often. You can use different screening tools. You're not obligated to use theirs. but. Um, but this is what we're happy with. And um, we had mostly nurses running this um, on a screening level. And we also had a social worker, a part-time social worker, who was wonderful running it, uh, running these questions to the students. It is incredibly time consuming. I sort of have ambiguous feelings because I, I feel like if the state's gonna mandate it, the state should be helping to fund it. It's really expensive to run this because it takes weeks. Because the minimum time you're going to spend with a student is five minutes, and that's a one-on-one -on -one screening. So it's, it's really time-consuming. It we, do it we did it during um, phys ed this year, and it worked really well. It, it, it was very smooth operation. We were one of the first districts to have it done for the state and submit our information to them. So we're all set with that. We don't have anything to worry about. We had a um, low probability, and um, which equated to um, low rate of positive screenings, which meant we had very few people that were really at risk for this in the seventh grade. We'll see what happens next year on the ninth. Um, I think that was, so we do have to uh, get sub nurses to cover the nurse's office while the nurses are doing this, because it, it's, it's, like I said, very time consuming. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bill. Briefly, um, state is not supposed to put an unfunded mandate on us, and <laughs> this sounds like an unfunded mandate, so uh, perhaps we can get from the administration an estimate of how much it's costing us to do this. It's probably going to, well, I, I have a, I, I, I don't want a ballpark number tonight. I oh, okay. like a well, real number that we can go and estimate. squawk <laughs> with, you know. Yeah, no, I have a rough estimate. It, it, it costs between $2,500 and $3,000 to do per school. Mm -hmm. Per school? Per school. Well, part of that is because I use a DPH grant, another grant mm -hmm. that I have, uh, to give a stipend to Ivy for running it. Because, see, she's also with the um, Arlington Youth Health mm -hmm. and Safety Coalition. Mm -hmm. So she can take these numbers to SAMHSA, which is a suicide, which is where her grant comes from, mm -hmm. and, and also use our data for that, too. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win situation financially. But, um, but we've been, I'm going to be offsetting mm -hmm. that through the DPH grant that we have, which is not generally allotted for that, but we can mm -hmm. sort of use our grants as we see fit, and then the state gives us the okay. Yeah, you can use the funds for that. That's fine. No, it will help for our squawking, and we'll probably go and, or I, I would probably go at the very least and see if other school committees are encountering the same issue and want to squawk in harmony. Well, they will. Uh, <laughs> so that to have the exact mandate, you know, the wording of the mandate, you must do this, who's saying we must do this, and how much it's costing us to do this, right. that information would be uh, a good thing to have so we could address sure. that. Because, uh, you know, Budgets are tight enough as it is right. without the state coming in and telling us to do stuff that costs us money that we have to divert from elsewhere. Right. Well, not every district district piloted it this year. Mm. We had to because we took the grant, the funding mm. last year, which paid for it for this year. Yeah, uh, but if this is a mandate coming in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, it's interesting, and I think that's going to be like a to be determined. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how that plays out. I am curious, like a place like Boston, mm -hmm. how are they going to fund this? That's a lot of money. I will say it would be great if we could get guidance in on this too, because they actually have more training yeah. to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a social worker, you know, we paid her to work the extra time and mm -hmm. help us with this. And she was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think she was the best person at it, to, mm -hmm. to be honest. So, um, I mean, if it's a condition of a grant and we're getting money from the grant, mm -hmm. it's. 
Well, yeah, it wouldn't define legally an unfunded mandate, but if this is something that's coming around is, uh, okay, the pilot's done, we're, you know, school districts are gonna have to do this, and you know, right. we wanna keep our eyes open. Yeah, I, I agree with that. They haven't turned around and said, okay, we're just gonna you know, continue to give you $10,000 every year to, to run mm -hmm. this. They haven't done that. Yeah. And I okay. don't think it's gonna happen, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, but it would be nice. We'll see, yeah. we'll see. Okay, um, this is just a, the, the questions that we ask on the craft screening tool. So you have that to look at if you need to. So field trips, I just wanted to bring this up. Um, we have a, uh, I'll be getting into the ICC grant next, which is the Innovative Care Coordinator grant. But we have uh, a very large increase in students with diabetes this year in our district. Um, it's almost epidemiological, to be honest with you. And you have to have a nurse on a field trip for anyone with a serious medical condition that requires either assessment and or intervention slash treatment, which could be medication. Mm -hmm. That does not include students that need EpiPens um, because we can train people to give EpiPens, but we can't train people to give insulin. So let's say you have, um, for example, at the Audison Middle School, we have five students with diabetes in the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen that happen before. It's very interesting. Um, and there's a lot of field trips. We have three sixth grade field trips going out three days in a row in June. So we have to send nurses, unless the parent of the student with diabetes goes on the field trip. I don't understand that. I mean, if the parent can, why can't the teacher be trained to do whatever the parent is? Is it a liability issue? Oh yeah. That's yeah. the issue, okay. Yeah. And, and, it, and it goes against the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm. At least that's what I was told by state DPH. Could be the same thing. If you, if you have somebody with an active seizure disorder and they need, the, the treatment for a seizure disorder is actually controlled substance. So you have to, if that, that you have to send that a nurse for that, yeah. you know? Um, so anything where, you know, in, in a hospital to give insulin, you have to have two nurses check it at the same, together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't just draw up insulin and give it to a patient. Two nurses have to sign off on it. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. I remember getting, there was a paste that if a child had an insulin shock, we would, came out of a, a tube and put it on the inside. Of, uh, did, is that to deal with the insulin shock? Well, we, we do, we can give that if they're conscious. I mean, mm -hmm. we were told to do that as teachers. Sure. Back then. Yeah, we, we can, but we don't know whether hyper, it's not up to a teacher, purview of a teacher to know whether that child is hyperglycemic, or in that case that you mentioned hypoglycemic, that's, they, that's not, well, yeah. I don't want to believe it. The child was identified to us, and we all, sure. I kept it in my desk sure. as long as that child, and yep. that was part of the information we passed on as the child went up. Right, right. Yeah, it's a different world. Much different. Yeah, I'm I, you old. know. I'm old. I understand now. The Department of Public Health mandates so much of our practice. Um, in fact, they mandate all of our practice, and um, and this is th this came down a few years ago. The only reason I'm mentioning it now is because it's becoming costly. Mm -hmm. Um, so much so, sometimes there's more that, you know, if, if there's multiple field trips going out and we don't have backup and per diem, then we have to hire agency nurses, and that doubles our cost. Mm. Um, we've been very lucky, knock, knock on wood, we've had a robust per diem group this year, so we haven't needed agency as much as I predicted. Um, but yeah, that's something that I just wanted to, people to be aware of. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I was interested reading this in your report and wanted to point out that I think that we need to bolster their budget to cover this because it's not fair to expect that, I mean, it's great if the parent wants to come, but it's not fair to expect that they should go. Right. And it's, you know, right. we just need to accept that this is a new and different cost of taking care of our children mm -hmm. and plan for it. Right. You know. Yeah, we can't deny it, um, a child Oh, your parents not going. You know, you can't go in the field. We can't do that. Right. Well, uh, you yeah. wouldn't want to anyway. Right. Of course and not. It's just we need to build this into your budget. It's. Yep. it's Thank you. <laughs> that would be helpful. Um, and there are a lot of field trips. The other thing too is we can't send nurses to field trips outside of the state. So, um, mm -hmm. if we send the students to the science camp in Rhode Island, that's a big problem. Um, that's a huge problem, mm -hmm. especially with students with diabetes. And I'll tell you why. If they need treatment and assessment in the evening, the nurse, the camp nurse, isn't there. She does, it's not. They're not there 24/7. They're only there, and sometimes till three, maybe four in the afternoon. So, what do we do? If a parent goes, great. 
but if it's out of uh, Massachusetts, we don't have reciprocity unless I'm licensed in that state. And you know, we could consider, you know, it, it's not too terribly difficult getting somebody licensed in another state, but it doesn't happen overnight. You have to apply. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and it costs money. So it, these are all things like Canopy Lake, can't send a nurse. Can't send a nurse. It's New Hampshire, and they're really tough. So what do we do, hire a nurse from New Hampshire? You're going to have to hire an agency nurse from New Hampshire or send a nurse that has dual licensure. Dual license. mm -hmm. Which <coughs> we, I don't know. I don't think we do have anyone with dual licensure. We did at one point, but yeah. I don't think so. So these are just all things to think about that, that I don't expect people to just know, hmm. um, but just trying to make people aware. All right. Um, so the Innovative Co Care Coordinator Grant we had for the last three years, it, we did focus on mental health issues, uh, which was a very big issue. Um, and it was, I think, successful. The state did cut everybody's funding on that grant. Um, so we lost a little over 50% of it. And when we had the Arlington Education Foundation grant, what, we, what came out of that was learning about the students with diabetes, the case management that went around that. So we have this wonderful um, nurse, Lauren Connors, who kind of, this is almost like a subspecialty of hers, is, is diabetes, type one. And uh, she is now our care coordinator. Um, it's been enormously successful. It, last year we had nine students in the district with diabetes. Presently we had 13, we, up until last month we had 14, and next year we're projected to have 15, minimally. That number might go up. Um, so that's a huge increase in just a little over 12 months. So um, she's been able to go on medical appointments with parents um, to talk with medical providers in regards to children who are at risk. Um, I think most of the parents in this town are pretty darn savvy about their ch children's medical conditions are on top of it. So, but she's, a, she's been a wonderful resource. Um, I think that the timing was almost karmic. It was really adventitious that we switched it over to diabetes. And um, she presented at the state meeting, innovative care, coordinating, care coordinator meeting last month, and uh, everybody was clapping for her after she presented the data. And now they want us to publish our data, which is exciting. Well, actually, we have no choice but to publish our data because we just signed the contract for next year, and they told us that was one of the stipulations, is that we either had to present this at a, at a much higher level, either nationally in terms of the work that we're doing, or, um, or or at a state level, or we have to publish uh, in, a, in a journal. So you'll get copies of that one, Go ahead. if that's what we do. I don't know what we're going to do yet. <laughs> this this is great what you're doing. Um, I had a question in the report. It says that you've got 16 children currently with diabetes. Um, yeah, we have what we had. Yeah, that was actually a mistake. That okay. was I thought we had 16. So that, okay. that's my call. okay. Um, yeah. We had. Um, one that just left the district, and then we have another one that's coming in, uh, but isn't here yet. So I was off by one, so it's not 16. Okay. It's currently. But I'm still wondering, this is beyond a normal amount from what I can tell, and I'm just wondering, are you discussing this with the Department of Public Health? Or oh, yeah. Because it, it's... Five, I mean, this the 16 I calculate is like five to eight times the normal mm -hmm. um, frequency that you would expect in this population. Well, we're starting to see this in other districts too. So we're not, this isn't isolated to our district. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, we are starting to see this more and more often, um, which is why they were glad we switched it to, to, from mental health to diabetes. Mm -hmm. So I agree from an epidemiological or biostatistical yeah. perspective, it's, it's it's high. It's yeah. it's gone up very quickly. Yeah. And I don't know why. But we're making sure people who might be interested well, they know. in finding out. Well, I have to them. submit this data okay. to the state every month. They okay. they're well aware of our numbers. Okay. They Great. know. That's I just want to make sure. Oh yeah, no, the state's well, yeah. That's why they had us present um, at the meeting cuz it they they know what's going on. Yeah. We've had conversations about it, so it's, it's all good. Um Okay, so I, again, I apologize for that. Projected 15 next year. So the other thing we did with the money is we bought iPads for all the nurses in the schools because most of the students with diabetes in our district have continuous glucose monitors on them. So the only one that's uh, FDA approved is the Dexcom 
to the best of my knowledge, I know it's FDA approved. I don't know that I know that there are others attempted to be FDA approved. This is great because when a child's um, blood sugar goes too high or too low, we know it alerts it. Um, the iPad sends an alert signal, and the nurse is aware of what's going on in the building. Um, the only time, a couple of handful of times, Wi-Fi wasn't so great, so we had some problems accessing it. But we have backup. But you know, I mean. What did we do before we had continuous glucose monitors? Child said they felt a little dizzy or lightheaded, and we checked them. We still check everybody by blood sugar. And sometimes we're still doing it, because to be honest with you, even though these are FDA approved, they're not that accurate sometimes. So we still, we will still continue to use backup methods to check students. But it's been great, because if we have somebody that we see their numbers are low, we can go find them in the building and say, hey, let's, let's, let's check you out and see what's going on. So it's been great. I have to say, the technology is wonderful. And it just goes to show you that um, it, this, is where, this is where medicine is going, is, is with the technology. So the infrastructure to support it is going to be important. Um, you can't see this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. But maybe on your own computer, you'll be able to expand it. Um, the identifiers of student names have all been changed to uh, completely different initials. This is the um, report that we, part of the report that we sent to the state so that they had the information on how we're tracking students. One of the things that came out of this, which is wonderful, is that these kids are not missing school because of they're diabetic. They're not. Unless they're newly diagnosed, they are in school even more so than some kids who have no medi known medical diagnoses. So to say that absenteeism is directly correlated to chronic disease is, in this case, not the case at all. And that, I think, is going to be where research goes in terms of absenteeism. It's, it's, it, if, if it's not directly related to medical conditions such as this. Um, so I just want to touch on Gibbs briefly, um, sent out the architectural recommendations. I did recommend because of the structure of the school that they have two AEDs in the school uh, just because of the layout. And I am recommending, uh, because of the number of students that are going to have diabetes coming in all at once, that they may need 1.5 school nurse positions when they open. Um, we are projected to have two students, only two at the, at the moment, but that number could change when the first year that Gibbs is open. Um, Millbrook, I just wanted to mention on that, we had a student um, at one of the schools that needed daily medications, so it pulled a nurse out of the office to run down, or myself, to run down and give the medication. It was nice to get out of the office and see the location and what they were doing. That was great, but it also put a good stress on the, on the department. We are using a public, uh, Department of Public Health grant to fund a, um, what we call a resource nurse. And they, they job share. We have someone two days a week and someone three days a week. That position is funded through DPH um, for their salary, and we've been able to utilize that person when that person was available. But if we have really low coverage on a particular day, we've had days, there's three nurses out, there's nine schools, and I have to um, go myself, or we have to maybe just have one nurse at the high school, which has happened actually frequently. If it's a high school nurse that goes, then there's only one left behind. So this is something to think about as well um, in terms of what their needs might be. Now, that student no longer needs da daily medications. Actually, the particular child needed twice daily medications when that person first went to the program. So that was, I was just like, oh my gosh. Um, but then it went down to once a day, and now it's, not, it's a non-issue. We're fortunate in that respect, um, but it, it's just something to also think about in terms of the future of Millbrook and the medical needs of these students. If somebody has a headache, we have to go down there, assess the student, and give them some ibuprofen. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of small detail notes. As I mentioned before, we did have a really robust per diem staff. Uh, one of student uh, was a previous Arlington student, so that was kind of cool. She worked out is working out really well. Um, we have had a decent turnover this year, which is not common, and it's been a great year. They're really wonderful new staff, and I. Couldn't be happier. Um, a lot of our nurses uh, either have a graduate degree or getting graduate degrees. So uh, we have a few that are becoming nurse practitioners and one that is going into school for nursing leadership. Um, I've been on the Department of Public Health Evaluation Committee every month this year. Um, it is through Boston University, bless you. Um, and 
unfortunately, we haven't done any research this year because it's Boston University's first year out running the DPH um, school health unit education. So all this year has been working on how to teach us how to do research. Hmm. I'll leave that there. Um, and we are also see, overseeing a small grant. We are partnered with Somerville uh, School System and we oversee a small grant for them. And then if they have questions about anything, um, I act as a consultant for them. And I also act as a consultant for all the private schools in the district. Um, the DPH grant has covered all of our professional development. And um, I think that's it. I think that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Um, thank you. This is uh, clearly I'm interested in it. Um, the one thing you didn't mention that's in your report is um, about the thing that Kara Dalton has been doing. Oh, at yes. Hardy. Thank you. And I thought that's, yeah. I don't think you have to go into it now. I wish it would be brought at another time. No, that's, um, that's, well, I'll just briefly, briefly talk about the statistics. So we don't, thank you for bringing that up. Um, the nice thing about electronic medical records is I can look at numbers. And the Hardy numbers are half what they were, uh, which is very impressive. When we see numbers climbing, you know, Audison's numbers are really high. They can see upwards of 90 something students a day. That's not unusual. Now, that includes medication administrations, right? Thompson School, same thing high number consistently, but Hardy cut in half. And so what is that? Is it the responsive classrooms? Is it the mindfulness work that the three people that I mentioned on there, um, Kara Dalton, Deborah Mutis, and Allison Cox, have been doing, going into the classrooms and teaching? I actually sat in on one of the classes. It's at, it was really good. Kara should be an, a teacher, as well as a nurse, or teach nursing. Um, but it, it just, the, the numbers are impressive. So. I think that needs to be explored. That, that's what I think it'd be really interesting to hear more about what it is they're doing and could we try and duplicate it in another school and, and figure out you know, right. can we make it happen again because it's just great. Um, with this training, the kids are you know, having half or less visits to the nurse, which is... You're keeping them in the classroom, yeah. which is what we really try to do. You know, it's, it's some people think, you know, we're like nurse ratchet, yeah. you know, it's, which... And they look, oh, that's my old nurse. Watch the old word. Um, but it's, it's uh, we really do try to get these kids back to class. I mean, sometimes they're coming down for the most innocuous things. It's just like, what are you doing here? You know? See that tiny little dot? That hurts, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, ah, you know? Um, it, it, but then there's certainly plenty of kids that are coming down for absolutely valid reasons, of course, right? So, but whatever they're doing, something's working. Yeah. Because numbers don't lie. Right. Um, so I thank you for reminding me because it is in the report right at the beginning and yeah. thank you mm -hmm. All set. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great presentation. We appreciate it. Oh, you mean it wasn't boring? Was it monotonous? No, it was great. Okay. Thank okay. you. Have a good week.